Welcome in for all of you that are joining. Let's take a few moments to let people um, come in. Make sure your sound's working. All right, we are live streaming on Facebook too. This is quite exciting. Um, and Trisha, thanks for, for being here. Um, all right, we're going to begin. We have almost 50 people and I'm sure more will trickle in. So thank you for joining us virtually today. Um, I will go through kind of housekeeping at, at the start and introduce the topic and Trisha, our our presenter and our guest today. Um, the topic that we are going to be covering is coping with caregiver worry today and our guest presenter is Trisha Wallace who is a clinical counselor and an educator with Parkinson Society BC and I am Kate Landreth. I am the education and learning lead with Family Caregivers of British Columbia and I'll be your host and moderator today um, during this webinar. So um, if you're curious what you're going to learn, you'll, you'll have lots of really good nuggets with this webinar and here are the key points. So uh, Trisha will be talking about worry and its impact on your health as a caregiver and also caregiver challenges and how it influences worry. And then she'll lead into strategies to address specific worries and planning, um, planning and strategies to apply into your life. So who are we as Family Caregivers of British Columbia? Um, thank you for joining. We are a nonprofit charity and we are dedicated um, to providing support for family and friend caregivers and, that are unpaid. We are in our 30th year, so we were celebrating this year uh, 30 years. And uh, our three pillars that we really look at providing support is through caregiver support, and that can be through our support line, um, that is Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 7 p.m. And we also have support groups, which right now they are virtual. And, um, and moving forward, um, we'll also have facilitator training. They're on pause in this moment. Um, but after, as things start to go back to um, more normal, we will, we'll have that, and then also caregiver coaching. And then our webinars fall into our education, um, and then we have engagement and collaboration with our healthcare sector. So um, there's more, there's tons to learn on our, on our website, but those are little tidbits of who we are. So for the webinar, just so that you understand there, everyone will be, remain muted and the cameras will be off. You will be prompted to reflect um, in certain areas and there's a chat box that I see some people chatting right now. So I'll be able to monitor that. And then there'll be at the end time for Q&A. So questions that you have for Trisha and she'll have time to answer those more specifically. And during the webinar, if you have specific questions that come in, um, just know that we'll get, them, uh, get to them at the, at the end. Great. And then our presenter, uh, Trisha Wallace, is um, currently a clinical counselor with Parkinson Society BC, and her background is in nursing, over 30 years of nursing. And so we're really excited to have her share her wisdom and her knowledge today. Thank you, Trisha. Thanks. Glad to be here. So the talk today is going to be on coping with caregiver worry. Thank you so much for taking your time 
lot of your busy days for this. I hope you find it useful and I'm looking forward to any feedback or ideas that you might want to share at the end of the talk as well as uh, through the talk during we using the chat. So what is worry? At first glance, worry is described like a feeling usually. I'm worried. But if we dig down a little more deeply, we can understand that there are other emotions like fear and anger or shock that are involved or underlying worry. And worry also has impact on the body. We can have responses like stress responses, tension, sweating, heart pounding, awful feeling in the gut. All of those things can happen with worry as well. But primarily, worry is considered a thought process. And you might have heard of the term worry a bone. And that kind of connects with like a dog with a bone. And with worry, our thoughts, we tend to gnaw on one concern, one topic over and over and over again, or maybe many talk topics, but we tend to really get stuck on these topics. So it's like gnawing on a bone. And we know if we think of a dog, if you try to take away that bone from a dog, it's really hard. We have to sort of work at it. And there's some similar processes with worry that we can do to work at moving away from these drives we have to stick with one particular concerning issue for us. There we go. So worry and planning overlap. Worry involves a little bit different than planning. Planning is a natural process. We want to look ahead. We want to prepare for things that concern us. Worry adds in that we are planning for worst case scenarios. And it involves usually life challenges that don't have easy answers or might not have answers at all. And of course, this is so much a part of living life as a caregiver or care partner. There are so many challenges and unanswered questions that you're grappling with every day. So counseling and support for worry focuses on what is possible to address. Because emotions can come and go, and life situations come, can come at us with immense speed, and they often compound without us be unable to recognize a solution. So the one thing we have control over is our thinking and our thinking processes. So that's often where counseling for worry focuses. So here's a definition of worry, and it's falling under cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a well-used and very well-researched form of therapy for anxiety and depression. And we can see that it's relating to an uncontrollable chain of thinking, focusing on topics. And the big part of this is the uncertainty, the uncertainty of future events and also that that worry fails to reduce the heightened sense of uncertainty so we're kind of wanting to reduce the uncertainty with worry thoughts but in actuality that that usually doesn't happen so cbt addresses the connection between thoughts feelings and behaviors and we know if we can change just one area of that triad, it will have an effect on the others. As I've said, thoughts are a key focus for addressing worry, but we can also help to lessen the effects of worry through modifying our behavior patterns and our responses to the feelings that we have inside our bodies when we're stressed, which is like our, our body's alarm system. And so this is 
part of what we call emotion regulation. And it's very much connected with how we manage our worry thoughts. Mindfulness CBT addresses the effects of emotional overwhelm and our ability to think things through. So there are many feedback loops involved between the mind and body, and that's in response to the stressors that we naturally feel. What we feel and sense is also filtered through the mind. So there's judgment involved in deciding if a sensation is acceptable or if it's a threat. And when we recognize a threat, there's a cascade of physical experiences over which we have no control. So this involves the peripheral nervous system, and that has two main branches, one being the parasympathetic branch and the other being the sympathetic branch. And the sympathetic nervous system is our activating system. And it's also the one that puts us into the fight and, and flight mode. The parasympathetic nervous system is involved in rest and digest. It's called the rest and digest system. So when stressed, humans tend to recognize things going wrong. We have a bias toward the negative stuff. And that's actually to protect us. We also stay more vigilant. So we prepare for the worst thing to happen. Now, humans are designed for stressors that come and go, though. And that would be, you know, just like a dangerous animal, for example. Be there, and then it would go away. And after a threat, usually we'd have a chance for that rest and digest process. And I call it rest and digest and hope for the best. That stuff gets dysregulated and out of sync when we're under chronic stress. So let, let's look at what happens with a typical rise and fall of emotions. Um, I call this you know, anger or anxiety mountain. If we encounter a threat, or even before, we have an alert system that comes on. It's actually part of our motivation system, actually. It keeps us interested and focused. And then we might have a, a threat that our mind sees, yes, this is an alarm. I'm, I'm threatened here. And as we're going up the mountain, usually we can still speak and think pretty well, and we can engage and listen and reflect. But then it gets to a point when, at the top of the mountain, we're in overwhelm mode. And in, that, in those moments, we have trouble listening to other people. We have trouble making decisions. And we can also tend to be defensive. Uh, we may be, have some more disdain, we may say things that we don't really mean, and we can say impulsive things and even act out uh, some of the anger and upset that we might have. And then on the way down, usually there's a regrouping period for people. So our mind becomes more flexible again and we can sort of sit into the rest. But commonly, what happens with chronic stress is there isn't very much of that regrouping period happening. And also, there could be during these times, there's a quiet time, but what happens is worry starts to move in. And it can actually be reflecting on what happened at the top of the mountain. Why did I say that? Oh, why did I do that? I feel so bad. And that kind of puts us back in to an alarm cycle. And of course, that usually means we're not sleeping well, we're not focused very well on other things in life, and that tends to increase the amount of worry that we experience. So here are some natural pictures of natural responses to prolonged stress. And um, I don't know if any of you have felt these, but I know I have over time. So how as caregivers do you find the time for this rest and digest stuff? 
um, I would like to you to just consider how your alarm responses work. And if you have time in your lives for this rest and digest process, uh, it's hard to find. And uh, it is essential though. The body, the physical body and the mind really needs this break from stress. And also when moving away from busy times as a caregiver, it's important for you to have a restful process rather than taking the time away from your loved one or ones to be preoccupied with worrying thoughts because that can happen as well. So the time away really isn't that restful. You're planning and thinking about what needs to be done instead. So I offer counseling around finding my mindful spaces in, in your busy lives. So we don't all have to sit in meditation for long periods and we're not all gonna be yoga experts, but there are mindful ways to move forward and find a little bit more rest in your days. So this involves some more focused work. And with mindfulness, we're looking at what's going on inside of us and noticing what's going on inside of us. And we're also noticing what's going on around us. But what we refrain from doing as much as possible, or at least be aware of, is judgment. How are we observing? And what are we judging? And what can we just observe as though we're recognizing and witnessing rather than judging things? So at, with the uh, focus work at the bottom of the, the mountain, you might start to uh, begin to express feelings a little different, find words for feelings that might not have easily come to you before. And also then looking at what is going on in my body? If I do notice things happening in my body, what are these things happening? And sometimes, a lot of time when we start to go up Anchor Mountain, we don't notice our bodies. We kind of go into our heads. And then we don't even know that we're moving towards the top because we're kind of out of sync with what's going on with, this, with our bodies that are telling us and giving us alarm bells. So uh, a lot of that has to do with once noticing things, what can we engage in mindfully to help us to bring down the sense of alarm that we feel. And then if we do get to the top of this mountain, we have to be kind to ourselves and realize that we're humans and this, these, these experiences are natural and they do happen. So on the way down in this reflection period, we can think about, okay, that was a, some of that stuff didn't work so well. I said something that was, I think, pretty hurtful, but it, it doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm doing. It just means that I, I made a mistake in that moment and that's okay. So the judgment of yourself is really important to give yourself a break. And if we, with mindfulness, focus on the here and now, the problems of the past and the challenges and worries of the future are not as important. So we are really focusing on what we can cope with now. And truthfully, we only have control over our own words and our own bodies and our responses in the moment. So what keeps worry going? Clients ask me like, why can't I get over this already? Like, what's wrong with me? I can't stop this worrying. And worry grows. It, it grows with uncertainty. And caregiving is just so full of uncertainty. So the hardest part is not knowing. And Caitlin Rowland and Nina Chappelle wrote uh, a paper about some research they did with caregiver stress. And they found that caregiver stress is always challenging. But physical issues or things that we can measure and things that we know about, we can cope with that stress a little differently than things that we can't know about that aren't as measurable, like changes in cognition or dementias, for example. There's even more stress on top um, because uh, we don't really know the outcomes. So we feel worry to feel security in the face 
of uncertainty. There's also the importance of knowing about depression because sometimes unrelenting worry and negativity and changes in emotion, uh, sadness, irritability, those things can happen because of a depression, depression, which is like an imbalance in the mind, in the brain of, of um, you know, neurotransmitters. And so it's important to talk with your healthcare team if you do notice that this is a, a thing that's going on for you, you're not sleeping, there's a lot of changes in your thinking or you're slowing down with your thinking and your movement. This can be uh, depression, clinical depression. So uh, mindfulness and CBT does work for mild and moderate depression. Uh, and but you might need a little bit more help if, if you reach out to your uh, to supports for that. And it's quite normal with depression also. Chronic stress and caregiving uh, can lead to a, you know, people, the lifetime prevalence of depression is about 12 to 20 percent of, of Canadians. So it is a common and very treatable thing. So illness uncertainty is uh, about it defined by different people, and they started defining this in the in the eighties, actually. So there's lots of this good research that still holds really true today uh, around illness uncertainty. And Katie uh, uh, Willard Virant did a, a review article about this, and. Uh, she talked about Michelle's uh, definition, the inability to determine the meaning of illness-related events. And then Hilton added something to that in 92, saying that there's also the perception of events, which is really important. So it's not just knowing the details about the meaning, there's a really important perceptual part of uncertainty uh, that we need to learn about and to be able to cope with. So speaking of perception, I'd like you to look at this picture and you might put in the chat box uh, what you see in this picture. You may have all seen it before. But what you'll notice is that some people might see a rabbit and other people might see a bird. So this is the type of perceptual issue that we can have when we're looking at challenges and changes in our lives. We have to look at how we're perceiving them and notice perhaps I'm perceiving this one way, but there might be another way to perceive it. So uncertainty typically has to do with ambiguity, we can't nail down what's going on. Uh, Kim McCormick did a study in the early 2000s, which still holds true today. Uh, one thing she reminds us of is that it, in, uh, uncertainty has to be seen in context. So that involves an interplay between what's going on around us and what's happening inside of us. So that kind of speaks to what we were talking about with mindfulness what's going on inside of us and what's going on around us. And we're not only going to include emotions and perceptions, we're also going to include our values and how we see the world, ourselves, and, and the people in it. When it's hard to accurately predict what will happen, it's only natural that we're going to start to plan and worry. So a goal of counseling for worry is to reduce the fear around uncertainty, not to fix the problems that raise the uncertainty in the first place. There's also uncertainty in healthcare. So we this is another layer that they talk about in terms of illness uncertainty. And Claire Goodman did a study talking about uh, how healthcare teams go about making decisions and how they communicate those with, with caregivers and, and family members. And uh, they, healthcare teams themselves can be uncertain exa of exactly how to proceed. 
So quite often there's a big discussion that has to be had about what stage a person is at in their illness process, what might be expected. So a big one, for example, is moving into a palliative stages, for example. And these, these answers aren't easily had. And a lot of illnesses can be staged quite accurately, but a lot of them aren't staged accurately. And so there's kind of this ambiguity and this uncertainty, not knowing where they're at with the clients. And so it's okay for, uh, for you as care partners to ask, well, where do you think we're at with this? If you're feeling like things are unclear for you when you go in or you, you have contacts uh, with your healthcare team and to validate that it might be you know, a challenge for the team as well. And don't forget to voice your loved ones values and their wishes. Advanced care planning, representation agreements, for example, are very helpful and you can get some support, of course, through Family Caregivers of BC uh, for uh, links and support and also uh, NIDIS, which is a personal planning and resource center, has some really great information that's available for you on that. So CBT for worry includes exploration of relationships with family, friends, everyone we know, and healthcare providers as well. And when I just had one question, I think just yeah. looking into this, someone asked specifically what CBT is. Oh, I guess I, I brushed over that too quickly. No, that's so, okay. Cognitive behavioral therapy has is shortened to CBT. Yeah, so it's that link between thoughts and feelings and behaviors. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, sorry about that. Uh, so we are looking with this, with this CBT, this cognitive behavioral uh, approaches to uh, figure out those behaviors and we, they're called safety behaviors, which I think is a really good term because we are trying to find a sense of security. And uh, these behaviors help us. They usually help us for a short time, but they don't resolve the imbalance that we can feel with worry. So I, I invite you to look at this list and do any of them look familiar to you? I can see uh, quite a number of them that I hear in my practice and I know that I feel for myself. And these typically can go together. They kind of can clump together. So avoidance and procrastination can happen when there's uh, the activation, but there's also something with the mixture of the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system that causes like a breaker to go off and we become hypoactive. We, we kind of just do less and we, we freeze. And avoidance and procrastination can involve that freezing response. And then what can happen is there's a squeeze, a crunch, and we've left it, left it, left it, and then all of a sudden we have to make a decision impulsively, quickly. Um, and checking and reassurance often goes together. So uh, ones that I, you know, have heard about with people is calling the doctor a lot or checking with our loved one a lot. Is it different? Is it different? Is it different for them? Some symptom they might have and then calling the team a lot or calling family and friends a lot over and over again because that first, it helps for that moment when you get that reassurance, but then the worry starts to come back in, the emotions start to rise again, and then we have to go check in order to get the emotions to go away again. So uh, if you notice them th themselves, of course, another one is doing everything yourself. That is a very significant one for caregivers. And there are two thought process and processes and worry that I want to talk about. And uh, Melissa Robichard and uh, Kristen Burr uh, have written a book called The Worry Workbook, and it's uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Skills. 
you can, there are other books out there and there's books from different realms uh, like acceptance and commitment therapy. There's a workbook, for example. Sometimes you work on these books alone and other times uh, you're, you know, can work on them in conjunction with a counselor therapist. Anxiety Canada also has an online uh, cognitive behavioral uh, thing that you can get engaged with, a program. And this workbook is kind of neat because it offers problem solving skills and uh, the two types of worry then are thinking about the things that could go wrong in a situation and as I've said it's worst case and catastrophic outcomes are typically what we're thinking about there and then mental problem solving so attempting to plan for or prevent all negative outcomes that are linked with thoughts about what could go wrong. So the thoughts come and then the planning and the fixing processes start um, in, in the mind. And Robichard and Burr talk about the worry fingerprint, which I find very helpful in working with people. So there's questions that we, we give to people to see what areas are they worrying about the most? What do those worries look like? Because everyone, just like a fingerprint, everyone has their own unique way of worrying. And when we get to zoom in on different elements of our worry processes, then we can start to create plans and options and ideas to to support ourselves and to figure out what that worry is about and how to help those worry stops, worry uh, cycles slow down or stop. So it, these, and it, another thing about the worry fingerprint is where do you worry? Because for example, I might worry less at work than I do at home, for example, because people at home notice there's certain things like safety around my teenager, for example. I'm much more worried about that. And people can read that in me. Um, that's not something I necessarily would bring to work. So that worry fingerprint helps to figure out the areas where we're worrying, as well as what the topics that we're worrying about. They also, Robichamber also talk about this worry cycle. So typically we have these trigger, again, we're looking at internal things, what's happening, happening inside of us. That could be a thought, um, something newsflash might come across. I mean, think about COVID-19 right now. We're really inundated with all of these triggers and concerns that are coming at us. And uh, then it can also be an internal and an external thing at the same time. Uh, you know, in a caregiving role, it can be uh, seeing, uh, the, you know, your loved one having, um, uh, doesn't seem to be swallowing very well today. And all of a sudden worries can happen. Well, what if, what if they, what if they can't swallow their pills? What if, and, and, and on and on, this big worry can happen with even one cue of seeing some challenge with swallowing, for example. So those are what the what if questions are. So this is this this is really important and things that we, we we look at is worry thoughts are usually what if thoughts. What if this happens? What if that happens? And so we with this worry cycle, we tend to look at what are the what if thoughts and then try and reframe them. So what if a catastrophic thing happens? What if the building falls down? That's catastrophic. But then it, we'd ask, what if one stair falls and breaks? What if the door doesn't open? So we take the catastrophic what if question and we introduce the variety of small problems that might happen. Those are much more fixable and that's what we need to work on as well with worries. Not to, we do need to plan, but we need to plan and think about things without it always being this overwhelming catastrophic event that we're, we're planning for. So with this cycle, we're trying to, in, you know, figure out the worry, 
And with the anxiety part of it, we're also looking at that physiological, the alarm bells going off with the, with the anxiety and learning how to sit with them and learning how to let those experiences flow through us rather than us reacting. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the next slide. So thinking traps can also go along with what if thoughts. And these are co uh, commonly used in cognitive behavioral approaches. So um, these are what if all or nothing um, ha can happen with, um, I always think this way. If something happens, I might say, oh, I'm not good at skateboarding, but I've actually only tried it once. It's sort of like I'm all or nothing, for example. Uh, catastrophizing, we've talked about that, the worst thing, overestimating, overestimating when things are gonna happen or how much they're gonna happen. Fortune telling involves not having any um, data at all, um, but having maybe an internal trigger and then thinking, uh, okay, I, I know it's gonna happen. We start to just imagine without any uh, objective facts at all about what uh, might happen in the future. Overgeneralizing is uh, around, um, yeah, that we can be, uh, again, thinking that in one event, will happen, or we have an encounter with one doctor who's really awful, or in that day, I shouldn't say awful, but let's say you have a, a, an awful interaction with somebody, and you come away feeling really badly about that, someone in the healthcare team, and then we say the whole healthcare team's terrible. That would be like overgeneralizing. Um, mind reading, uh, again, um, we don't know what people are thinking. Sometimes we assume our partners or people in our lives, we know what they're thinking when we really don't. We have to ask them. And of course, a negative brain filter, which we've talked uh, quite a lot about, about. So all of these things, noticing these things, help us to figure out responses and how to how to reframe our thoughts. Disrupting patterns is also really important for cognitive behavioral approaches. So examining our worry cycles is part of this process, and we want to shift gears and have an overview of events. So this means breaking them down into smaller bits, the date and time, what the trigger was, uh, and what worry did we have, or what worry do we have for a future event? We can also do that going somewhere. We have a worry about that. How, how much worry do we have about it? And then we explore what our anxiety is and our safety. Uh, behaviors that might go with that and measuring things is really important as well because then we know how far we've come or we might think we also can go back and say hey this strategy isn't working as well as I'd like to I need to switch up and try something different and cognitive behavioral approaches always sort of have a measure a measurable part of um, experiences in order for us to know and I've had clients who have uh, done this pattern disruption and, and little more sometimes, but just looking at these patterns and they say they notice, their, their, their people in their lives notice that they're not as upset, for example. It can really make a big difference. And that's the, the power of this triad of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we can work on. Also, we can conduct our own experiments. So this is about being as objective as possible. And we take a, uh, an outcome um, and we explore how actually the, what happened with the outcome. So we might have an experiment again with what, uh, what you fear will happen and then actually what did happen and compare the two. And then look at your coping. And even if the coping didn't work as well as you wanted to, you're still reviewing what you did. And that tells the mind and body there are things that you can do. And if you don't judge yourself and you say, okay, this didn't work as well as I wanted it to. However, uh, I learned from this and we reframe and talk about it in that way. Um, that helps us to move forward and have some more confidence to try again and to feel more 
calm and uh, secure with those trying. Um, there's also uh, Robichar and Burr talk about the uncertainty workout. So that involves a conscious decision and a plan to do the opposite of what we usually do, which is acting on the worry. We want to fix it. We want to do it. We want to do something about it. So instead of doing that, we focus on our feelings and responses. So we take an uncertain situation, we think about this typical safety behavior that we have and we notice what we're doing and we try and not do that safety behavior. We refrain from it. And then we see how long that works. Sometimes we start with a small amount of time and then do the, unsafe, the safety behavior. So, and then we just let that time, ex, amount of time grow. So if we're typically calling someone 10 times a day, we might break it down to eight times and then five and three and, and see how we can tolerate the anxiety and the emotions that arise from uh, not doing it. And what that does is it ends up giving us, like I said, confidence in the ability to know, hey, I can do this, I've got this, I've got other ways to solve these issues. They also talk about the working the good enough muscle. And we might worry about trying to alter our own emotional re you know, responses and our behaviors, but we also have to look at our goals. And so uh, one example I can think of is uh, if a care partner wants to uh, have a, their loved one take the pills at a certain time. And let's just say the person you're, you're caring for does not want to take their pills or does not take them. That can really flare up a lot of worries and, and upset for the caregiver. And you try different things, it doesn't work, and then the worry cycle can really start to, to go. And so reviewing the goal is really important. So what's the goal, overall goal here? Um, it's not just about fighting with the person to take the pills. It's about taking the pills to have quality or comfort in life, for example. You, know, you, you design, you figure out your own goals. What are those goals? And that helps to sometimes pull away and look at new ways and different ways to uh, work through uh, the, the challenge of, of pill taking. And if your care partner, the person that you're caring for doesn't take their pills, but you've tried everything, that's what you can do. And you have to reassure assure yourself that you've tried and look for new ideas and look for support, but you did not fail. I think that's a big part of this good enough uh, muscle is we need to know that we try everything we can and if things don't work out what kind of goals do we have and how can we reframe the goals and make it not all about ourselves and have it all on ourselves it's it's a burden that uh, doesn't reflect the context and the situation that um, you're living in so again, with difficult decisions can be very worrisome. Uh, big ones that we hear are moving from home to facility, for example, or from coming from hospital back to home. And uh, working through these challenges uh, is can create a lot of worries. Of course, we wanna start small and focus on one element of that, a bigger goal at a time. Um, making lists can be very helpful. And those can be lists can be in order of importance or time, what's most timely and time sensitive, or perhaps what you know best and what you feel the most confident and comfortable starting to, to plan around. Uh, look at the pros and cons, make those pros and cons lists, and also ask for feedback. Um, but uh, remember that it is feedback and that we don't have to always uh, follow um, the feedback that other people give us. We still need to think about that. And that's where those sort of um, impulsive decisions might come, for example, if we think, oh, someone said something and, and, and I'm going to go with that because 
that's they seem to be the person who knows best remember that as a caregiver you also have a lot of uh, important knowledge to share and a lot of um, important uh, decisions to make as part being part of the process and the last couple of things i want to talk about are just reaching out and getting a chance to get the support that uh, you need. There's so many dif different great options and of course Family Care Givers of BC is a, such a wonderful resource for you and part, if your loved one or your people in your family, friend circle has Parkinson's disease, you're welcome to call us at Parkinson Society BC and we have free counseling for example and lots of great resources and supports and webinars for you to look at. And uh, this is a great quote that I love, is taking care is one way to show your love. Another way is letting people take good care of you when you need it. And that's Fred Rogers, which is Mr. Rogers from television. So thanks so much. I'll leave you with this last quote. Be kind to your body, gentle with your mind, and patient with your heart. I'm welcoming any questions that you might have. Thank you, Trisha. I do have some a few questions that come in. Um, I'll leave that slide up just for people if they want to take any notes. Um, and I'm happy to respond to any Family Caregivers um, of British Columbia resources questions. Um, but we have one question. I'm not sure if you would be able to answer this one, but they um, have made it ask, are there any caregiver um, respite, respite sorry, organizations you would recommend in the Vancouver area or maybe a contact point for that? Yes, there are uh, there are a couple of uh, respite places, and they have a day program, which of course is suspended right now. And then they also have there's one in Vancouver itself that has a um, has a, over longer respite uh, possibilities over uh, days. And also, uh, there are respite options in different facilities that you can also explore. So I'm going to recommend that you go if you do have a um, a case manager through uh, uh, Vancouver Coastal or Community Health, whatever your community health team is, that's a good person to explore uh, your respite options with. And uh, if you don't have those, uh, I recommend that you uh, do make contact with them and do start to get involved with community health because uh, those are the folks who uh, are going to ha help you get in anyway to the respite beds. Thanks, Tisha. Um, the next question was, how do you know you've tried hard enough when there's always more that you can do? And do you need to reach a breaking point first to have that awareness? Or... Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's such a good question. And it's different for everybody, isn't it? But I have to say that 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 good enough muscle is you're engaged and you're doing what you can. And that's, that's trying hard enough. You're really doing what you can. And I, I think a reframing that feeling that you have to do everything is really important. And it's okay. It's okay to ask. It's okay not to know. Uh, there's so many uncertainties to, to work through. That is uh, a question, for example, that might work really well with some of these worry exercises. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I don't know. You let me know. Thanks, Trisha. And then the last one, um, Marnie has asked, is there any um, online and free resources for family members who cannot get home support? Or if a family member uh, doesn't want strangers, even nurses, unless emergency in their house? So they, they need, sounds like they need somebody in the house, but that person isn't allowing people in the house? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's, um, it might be because of, yeah, Marnie said yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Is it co because of COVID or is in general? Um, 
not just because of just in general she said okay. yeah yeah that's, that's a big challenge isn't it because we have to explore whether that person is competent to make their own decisions right and living at home uh, living with an illness being an older adult uh, people can make we all make bad decisions sometimes and if we're competent to make those decisions then it's really hard to push stuff on people if they don't want it um, what uh, I've recommended it for people is to uh, try and find a motivator, try and find something that the person's interested in. So instead of a lot, talking about you need help, you're not doing well, we're worried about you, we're judging you in a way is what the message could come. That's when people can start to feel defensive. Uh, so sometimes we'll talk about, well, what do you want to work on? What are you, what do you want to do? And even introduce the idea of someone else coming into the home that might not be a, a direct caregiver. They might do something else together that they like to do. And that helps people get a little used to having another person in the home. And then that the opportunity to address more support might be more feasible for them. And the flip side of that is if you do notice any risk behaviors, if you notice any challenges that you need to look at, the seniors distress line, that sale line uh, can, can help to figure out, is this risky? Should we be you know, doing something more about this? And they'll help walk you through that and help you figure that out. Great. Thanks, Trisha. And Marnie said, thank you. Great. Um, Works. I had someone just asking, um, what is respite? Okay. So respite care, respite means a break, right? And so respite care is having a chance for the caregiver to take some time away from the person that the caregiving job. And sometimes respite is uh, a few hours. Sometimes it's a whole day or overnight. And sometimes it's for blocks of weeks days and weeks so there are uh you can look at respite you can uh, look at it online i'm sure family caregivers would have some good resources for you and decide if that's something that you're interested in sometimes it's covered by partially depends on your income and what's going on so some people it's covered by uh more uh, financially and other people have to pay more for it so there's a it's a unique to your situation in terms of what the costs will be for respite I have a question. Um, how do I find a counselor or therapist who specializes in this area that you were talking about today, Trisha? Uh, there are uh, counselors available through search engines. Um, so uh, uh, the BC Association of Clinical Counselors, for example, has a search engine. And um, I work with people who have uh, caregiving challenges as well and many other people in in private practice can do that for you and so you put your name in you put the the um the uh what you're looking for under a drop down menus in these search engines and then they'll they'll give you names of people thank you and i can share some of these resources too um on some of our our social media pages too um, yeah, there's lots of other ones yeah. too. Yeah, there's uh, quite a number of them that are available. Um, I have another question. Could you continue and answer for that good enough question, please? You said it would be a good one to work through the worry steps. I'm not sure what Mary... So that was the one of whether I'm... How do we know when we're... Oh, yes. Is that yeah. the one? I think the... The question above was, how do you know you've done enough? Yes, how do you know yeah. you've done enough? You know, sometimes it's when we feel exhausted or when we feel like, hey, I got nothing left. That can happen quite, quite commonly. Uh, other times people kind of move through things and do a lot. But another key thing around our environments is we might be doing a lot with the person we're caring for and then we go into what I call the room of shame which is a room full of 
bills and papers and taxes and whatever might have been set aside. So that's also a cue. Yes, I'm spending so much time engaging with this caregiving role, I'm not doing this other stuff. Or ask yourself, when was the last time you uh, called a friend? When was the last time you got out for a social distancing walk of, you know, or a walk on your own? When were the last times that these things you know, have happened for you. So it's really important to pay attention to ourselves because we can get so acclimatized to doing this caregiving stuff, we actually don't even notice when we're getting depleted. Uh, so that those are some cues to look at for yourself. Thank you. And I also get feedback from other people. Sorry, get feedback from other people too. Yeah. Um. Hazel, thank you. I've seen you posting. Um, Hazel has posted a bunch of things with um, the island. So I, I believe it's around mental health recovery. Um, thank you. I can also link some of this stuff, just trying to scan through questions. Um, one question is, we've lost five weekly support activities and programs because of COVID. Um, how does one consider replacing all of this as a family? I think that's a common thing that we It is hearing. such a common thing now. And actually, I'm really glad you can get on something like Zoom because a lot of people don't even have the, the Wi-Fi or the, the capacity on their computers to do these sorts of things. So uh, online activities are typically what people are doing. Um, family involvement can... I just did a webinar a little while ago on relationships and finding ways to connect with each other because we can be by ourselves in the house even though we're kind of all together and so finding some icebreakers like we started doing them at our kitchen table like uh you know naming five things that we like about the other person quickly and things like that to just sort of get that connection going with people again not about wear a mask wash your hands don't go out all the stuff that we can get on with covid and um Sometimes, uh, if it's with a, a care partner, um, actually, there are lots of exercise things that you can do uh, together that are online. We have a lot of them with Parkinson's Society, for example. They're actually good for everybody. They're really good, <laughs> really good webinars. And um, I'm sure you have a lot going on as well. Um, another thing that you can work on is a life review. If, you're, if your care partner is uh, looking for something to do and they used to go do some um, uh, activity more with their their um, thinking or sharing and they don't have that now uh, letting them record or you scribe uh, memory memories that they have so it's called memory banking so we get them to think about a good memory that they had or what was the funniest thing that happened to you what was the most exciting thing that happened to you tell me about that and you write that down or they say it into a re recorder or whatever and that really entertains people but it also helps their minds it helps their energy and their sense of self because some you know people say i'm they're not all i'm not just this person who's got an illness i'm not this just this person who's old i have this whole life behind me but they can we can forget about it and as caregivers we also can forget about this rich life that someone might have led and so for them to re revisit that is usually very good for their mental health as well and it makes it fun for people to to hang out with them the kids can do it with them you know, you go, go sit with grandpa or go do the kids don't know what to do. Well, this is a great way to engage. Yeah, I love that. And building relationship while you're yeah. doing that. And you do it by Zoom, right? You can do it by Zoom too. Um, is it better to have a single caregiver versus more than one caregiver from the extended family, which is better for the worry factor? I think every family just designs it as they can, right? Sometimes if a lot of people are in the picture, then everyone just gets a little bit of stress. Um, a big thing is consistency and making sure that we're not doing what they call triangulating in families where two people start talking to, with each other about the person that you're caring for uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, 
messages that are unclear and they might be shared with only two people and not the third person for example in the tri in the triangle so it's important to to figure that out for yourselves uh one thing too for stress for that that care partner though is um are they going to be uh, stressed out by having so many different people and is if there is a primary care partner involved that primary caregiver are they going to have to be stressed because they have to kind of train six people instead of just working with one person who really gets to know it really well yeah i think that's one area too um, that we speak a lot about at family caregivers building a circle of support and sharing yeah. sharing the load and people having different roles that um are they're accountable for Yes. Um, I'm just mindful of the time and people that are, are on. There's a few more questions. Um, Trisha, I want to be mindful of your time. Do you have time for maybe one or two more questions? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, okay. Are there any advocates for family dealing with um, political admin nurses? Uh, sorry, let me read through this one. That might be something private that I think we can follow up with. I'll send that to you, Trisha, and sure. um, and I have email addresses. So, um, okay, this is one a common one that comes up. How do we feel with family who are in long term care, um, like with visiting and not being able to see these people? Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? Especially since they don't typically have access to computers or. They, you know, the staff don't have time to set them up, even though, you know, you people bring the iPad in and then the, the staff don't have time to set up for the Zoom meeting or whatever it is. So yeah, that that is really a challenge. And so um, what I've uh, had some experience with and talked about is uh, writing letters again and sending them and them getting that piece of mail every every week for example is usually quite exciting for people um, and they might include some pictures hopefully those pictures get up i would suggest you make photocopy pictures not the actual pictures because those things can go missing in a facility um, yeah and other t and it's hard isn't it um, i don't know if they have phone access but uh, if they do that's also something that uh, the facility can bring in the room and make it a regular thing like something that's a little bit uh, of a special thing that um, your loved one can can uh, can look into some people do the visiting at the window and that sort of thing but it's really hard if there's cognitive difficulties and for people just trying to figure it out and and figure out why is this person at the window and it can be more confusing and more anxiety provoking for them so it, it, those those sorts of one-to-one -one challenges can have to be thought through with the care team pretty well and um, one last question I see here. So um, someone specifically saying that a lot of worry during like <laughs> late night hours. So how do, uh, what about these, those worries that start at 2.30 a.m. and how do you get off or how would you recommend to get off the worry train then? Yes, the worry train. And it's those quiet times, right? That our mind starts to run because our safety behavior could be staying real busy and and that could be something that that um, we do quite uh, we need to do as caregivers so uh tuning doing the mindfulness based stuff can be very helpful and guided mindful uh just mindfulness sessions are really helpful typically they involve finding an anchor usually the anchor is the breath uh, but it, if there are any breathing uh, challenges that you have, uh, you don't always have to use the breath. Uh, sometimes a physical anchor, like holding something, having something in your hand can be really great for an anchor. You can have a visual anchor where you're thinking about a certain um, object and, and have that in your mind's eye all the time. The idea is to go back to that anchor and feel the feeling and the thought will come in that anxiety thought will come in the worry thought will come in and we just try as best to say worry you name it so it's like a, a visitor that's really stinky you don't really want them in but they're going to come in anyway so you just let them in but you don't entertain them and they get bored 
and they go. So if you continue to think about the breath as much as possible, and also know that this is a skill, it might not work the first 10 times you try it, but it's a skill over time that you'll start to, to really use. And you'll start to use it more than just at night. It, it's something that will become almost automatic if you try to use it a lot. Uh, and sometimes you feel a little bit more anxious when you start mindfulness. And that's usually because all of a sudden we're starting to tune into our body. So we're actually the anxiety was there all the time. We just didn't notice it because we were so busy doing everything else that we need to do in our lives. So those are some tips I have. And there's lots of really great uh, recordings out there and apps. I also have a great app uh, through Kelty Mental Health that I send most people because it's free and it's terrific. It's Dr. Vo, Dr. V-O. And if you Google Dr. Vo, Kelty Mental Health or Dr. Vo uh, Mindfulness, it'll come up. Uh, and I recommend they have very short ones and they have longer ones and some really great mindfulness exercises. Oh, that's so wonderful. And um, we have been leading every Wednesday morning mindfulness live on our Facebook. So, um, and uh, so lots of breathing and coming into the body if you're interested to join us as well. And I've noted down a lot of these resources, Trisha, and we can connect after and I'll put them up. Um, either on the email that will get sent to you, just thanking you, or, or on our social media pages. Um, so many thank yous that are coming in and that this information is very, very helpful and timely. And um, thank you, Trisha, for your time and your wisdom. I took so many notes just for myself. I, I think it's, it's, it's great. And some people share that they're not specifically caring right now for someone, but they're working in relation with other caregivers. So I think it's really, really important information to hear. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to a possible other webinar and um, stay tuned. We'll be posting um, more schedules with our webinars um, as we move forward into, into June. Thanks, Trisha, for your time. I so appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. Take care. Be safe. Thank you.